I like to mess up today some people. And just say, you know, the power of prayer turned that thing because the church spoke and the, and the, and the winds obeyed and the, and the Holy, and just turned that thing. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I just come to you, Lord, right now. Lord, Lord, you can see that thing. That thing's a powerful storm. And in the eye of the storm, you're there, Father God. And I ask right now in the name of Jesus, by great, your mercy, your grace, Lord, that you would hear, and that, Lord, you would turn that thing hard east. Turn that thing out into the Atlantic, God. Let it not even touch or come near land, oh God. Let, let, the, let, the, I mean, let the media, let the weather, let those people on these networks that say, I don't know what happened, but there was, a hard, there was a hard right turn came, and that thing just moved on out of its business, oh God, and didn't harm nobody. Because, Lord, that's the power of prayer. And I put a hedge around the coast, all the, all the eastern coast, in the name of Jesus. I put a spiritual hedge around the, the area of the Bahamas, Lord, somehow or another you would go through it, Lord, you would work in it. And follow that. Let them know that the hand of God is here. And that, Lord, because a man defied and spoke it, it existed because he spoke. Because we call those things that are not as though they are. And we receive it. And I receive it today in the name of Jesus today. I receive it today in Jesus' name. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm just going to pray in the Holy Ghost right now. And, uh, there's an atmosphere of peace in the room. There's a presence, you see. Uh, is a presence here. And I believe the Holy Spirit is here because he wants to go into the closet of your heart today. Oh, oh say oh, say oh. And I'm going to share, my wife and I are going to speak today together. We're going to speak together. We, even, we got, even got rehearsed. We don't rehearse stuff. I said, what are we doing? I said, you do that and we'll take it from there. She said, where'd you come in? I said, let the Holy Ghost don't want to rehearse something. I really believe that we have to flow in the Holy Ghost, me and her. And I'm going to deal with it. But, Lord, I'm going to pray, Lord, right now in the name of Jesus, that you would hear the words. That Lord, I take, I'll come against distraction because there's a spirit of peace in here. You can feel it. It's, what is that? It's his presence. You see, we are the tabernacle. The tabernacle, what? It ushered and kept God's presence in. See, we want to keep the presence of God in the tabernacle. We don't want to run the presence away. We want to allow the presence to come in. Because when the Holy Spirit can come in, he can do what no man can do. Come on. He can do what you and no man can do. But you see, you have to allow him to come into that place. It's called your secret place. Everybody's got one secret place. But I'll let you know today that whatever, whatever's dealt in your life, we've been taking about, we've been on this I am thing, and I just felt this word. I just talking about I was talking about his grace is efficient, his grace. And then I just said, you know what? This is where I'm going to go at. It's, it's, uh, today's message is called, His Grace is Sufficient for You. Father, I ask you, Lord, you anoint the words in my mouth here, God. This is not me, but it's you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. This is Paul's vision, and Paul had a, a thorn in his flesh. Now, we're not talking about a thorn, thorn, but how many of you have got, uh, I got four big rose bushes in the back. I have, every, every now and then I have to go in and do a little, little landscaping. And I get around those rose bushes. You ever find that thorn? It would just prick you. It would just, it's like, ow. I never felt the thorn felt good. Like, ooh, that felt good. You know? And it was Paul's talking here that is, that, that's not actually a thorn in his side. But usually a thorn is pain, suffering, or trouble. Jesus wore what? A crown of what? Well, a crown of thorns. A crown of pain. He took my pain. He took my grief. So with Paul, but Paul... It's going to go back in time a little bit because Paul's going to go back 14 years ago because, remember, Paul was actually Saul. But we say when people really had a transformation from God, when God really did something, we call it, we call it the Damascus Road experience. You know, somebody, has, somebody has such a transformation. They got saved, and literally just went, like, they did a 180. I mean, just literally just, they just didn't gradually get, they just got saved. And they just went from this way to that way. It's like God did a renovation all at one time. We call that that Damascus Road experience. He had a Damascus Road, meaning Paul, and Paul met the Lord on that road. I mean, the Lord touched him. He was never the same. He was just never the same that God changed his name from Saul to Paul. That's, that's, a, that's a makeover. That's an extreme makeover when God can change your name. So Paul could boast about that, but Paul said, wait a minute, time out here. I got to remember this. God opposes the proud, but he gives, he gives grace to the humble. You know, you can be humbled or you can eat humble pie. 
Humble pie don't taste good. You chew on it, and guess what? Not good. Let's go read the Word of God. Here's Paul. Let's get Paul right here. He says, I, I must go on boasting, although there is nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to the visions and revelations from the Lord. Paul had many visions and revelations for the Lord. He could get boasted and proud of. I know a man in Christ about 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven. That's Paul in Acts chapter 9 when Paul gets, Saul gets, gets chained, uh, to, chained to Paul. And he said 14 years ago, so he understands this, 14 years it happened. Whether it was in the, I had an experience with the Lord. You ever talk about having an experience with the Lord? And he said, you, you, sometimes you have an experience with the Lord. You know if you're dead or alive. You're like, I, this time the Lord had an experience with the Lord. I actually, uh, it was cold one night. I actually was breathing on my mouth. See if I'd seen air or frost come out of my mouth because I, I thought I was dead. It was the Lord just visited me. I had a visitation from the Lord. And he said, whether it was in my body or out of my body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do know, but God knows. I was caught up in the paradise. And the third, in, in uh, inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, about my weaknesses. Well, that's just... He just shifts right here on you. Even if I chose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so that, I'm, so that I will think more of me than is warranted by what I say or do. Or because there's surpassing revelations. God gives me such revelation. I want to be so heavenly minded, but I, don't want to, but I can be heavenly minded so much that I can be no earthly good. You know what I'm talking about here, right? I got all this realm. God's speaking to me. God, I got all, I could boast in all of that, you know, and everything, but I choose not to. Because I remember who I was. Here's a word for you. Don't ever forget where you come from. Don't ever forget where you come from. At times when I do that, it gets me humble. I remember who I was without Christ. And because of grace is why I'm here. He says, Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited or prideful, I was given this thorn in my flesh. We talked about it. It felt like it was a messenger of Satan. He was tormenting me. There was this thing that was in pain that was something in my body. With, they don't really tell you what it was exactly. But this is what verse 8 says. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Some passages say, some, some passages say this. Three times I begged the Lord. How many know the difference between pleading and begging? Pleading is one thing. Begging goes to the next extreme. You ever know what I'm talking about? I beg you. You know, it's a different, at, different atmosphere, right? He says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, this is, this is the words of Jesus, but he said to we, me what? Not your grace. It's not your grace. It's not Bonnie's grace. Not Pastor D's grace. My grace. Say My grace. My grace is sufficient for you. Woo! For my power is made perfect in weakness. Woo! He said, my grace is sufficient for you. Why? He says this. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may do what? Rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecution, difficulties, anything that comes my way. Because it is, for when I am weak, then I am strong. There's a shift all of a sudden. When I am weak, the power of the Holy Ghost gives me the grace to become strong. Because it's in Christ. It's in Christ. If I am the vine and you are the branch, therefore, if those who remain in me, from a part of me you can do nothing, but in me you can do all things. Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who gives me what? Strength. So what is Grace. Sometimes we misuse grace and, mis and misuse grace. You know, grace, listen, grace is this. I tell you this, grace is a, gift, is a gift of God. It's a gift. It's a gift from a heavenly father given through his son, Jesus Christ. 
It has been, it has been defined as a divine influence which operates, which operates in humans to regenerate, which regenerate, to re, again, to produce, become born again. So when you got saved, the old man passed away, a new man came in, regenerated. And what not, the grace will give you not to regenerate you, but to sanctify you. What do you mean sanctify? It makes you more like Jesus. It separates you. See, grace comes in, and I don't do the things that other people do. Why? Not because I can't, not because I'm too this or do that, because the Spirit of God won't allow me. Because why? His grace is sufficient for me. You see, I don't, I don't have to bow down to things. I don't have to succumb to things because His grace empowers me. The Word says this, that what? And also what? It imparts strength and resist temptation. You see, because of grace... I can resist temptation. I don't have to fall into it. And listen, God gives me the freedom to walk away from it. I don't have to be caught in it. Why? It was his grace came on me. It was what? It, it was a gift. You know, when something's a gift, you treat it like a gift. I thought about that day. I, I washed a truck in, 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 in 2000 and, uh, let's see, no, 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 I'm in 10 years. In 16. I was, uh, it was my 10-year anniversary as a pastor here. And the church bought me this nice truck. A used truck, but bought me a nice truck. Now, that was a gift. I didn't deserve it. It was given to me. But you know what? How I treated the gift, it was in response of how I appreciated the gift. Whoo! I can take it and don't do nothing in it. Run it down. Burn up the transmission. And you say, wait a minute. You just misused the grace I gave you. But you know what? Because it's a gift, I treat it like a gift. I take care of it like a gift. Because why? The gift was given to me. I didn't deserve it. That's what salvation, that's what the cross, the cross was a gift to you. The cross was a gift. And sometimes... The word, of God, the word of God tells me that the cross, it was the gift. Not a gift, it was the gift. There's a difference between gifts, but it was the gift. It says, I think it's Ephesians 2.8 uh, 2, says this, For it was by grace that what? You, it was by grace that you were saved through faith. It was by grace that you were saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. The word says, Ephesians 2, it said, it is the gift of God. Now, it is the gift of God, not by works that no one can boast. He said, my great, what? It causes me to resist temptation, offered through the mercy and the love of Jesus Christ. He said this, that his grace is sufficient for me. Sufficient means this, it means more than enough, more than what you need, an ample supply. In other words, he's not short, he's not short. His grace, whatever you go through, is sufficient for you. And sometimes I beg the Lord, Lord, take this thing from me. Jesus in the garden asked himself, Lord, if this is another way, take it from me. And sometimes I say, Lord, if this is, the, Lord, please, this thing's more than what I can bear. Take it from me. And sometimes you don't hear an answer. And sometimes I hear the word, my grace is sufficient for you. How many heard that before? You heard that. You heard that. You didn't know what was that. All you heard these words, my grace is sufficient for you. And that's all I had. I didn't have the answer. I didn't have this, but I knew that if his grace was sufficient, that his grace was more than enough than what I need. And grace does not come upon you ahead of time. Grace comes on in the moment that you need it. I wish grace would get ahead of time to prepare me for a phone call that would change my world. And you experience that. One phone call could change your world. You know what I'm talking about here. And you say, oh, Lord, in that moment, that's when grace kicked in. How I many know what I'm talking about? In that moment, you didn't know what to do. Your mind, everything was going crazy at one moment. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the gift of God, the grace came in. Because when I am weak, somehow or another, I became strong in him. That's the grace. That's his grace. What he's saying is this, sometimes I can take things from you 
And then sometimes you're going to have to go through it. But I'm going to let you know one thing. My word is my word. My grace is sufficient for you. I want the answer. No, you don't want it now. But grace is going to help you walk through it. Listen, I mean, know what I'm talking about here. My gra- your grace is going to help you walk through it. You didn't understand it. You couldn't comprehend it all. You couldn't understand, Lord, why is this taking so long? Why has this thing happened? I beg you, take this thing from me. Lord, do something. Do something. And he says, my grace is sufficient for you. And all of a sudden, this peace comes on you can't understand. It, what happens is, in my moment of weakness, he, because I was in Christ, therefore, if anybody remain in Christ... Because I remained in him, and he is divine, and and I am the branch, that Holy Ghost gave me ample supply. It gave me fuel because I was connected to the I was connected to the vine. You see, people disconnect themselves and wonder why they can't handle it. Because you're trying to do it in yourself. But if you could just say, Lord, I quite can understand it all right now. I thought you would take this cup from me. I thought, Lord, there's another way. See, I like to go over things. I don't like to go through things. I'm going to be honest with you. I'd rather, I'd rather go around the fire than go through the fire. I'm just going to be me. I'd rather go, instead of going through the water, I'd rather go around it or go over it. Get me a boat. Let me go across. But sometimes life's hard, but God's good. Say it with me. Life's hard, but God's good. All the time. Because all things are working together. Say all things. All things are working together for my good. All things. All things are working together for good. Even though I don't see it. Even though I don't understand it. I can't smell it. Can't do anything. I see nothing happen. And in fact I see time. Sometimes the more I pray. The worse it gets. So I'll stop praying. Oh don't stop praying. Press on in. And press on in. Because why? When you're weak I become strong. Whew, that's Holy Ghost. I feel the Holy Ghost all I'm, whoo, whoo, Lord Jesus, Holy Ghost, man, whoo. See, the presence comes on me, and I go, Lord, help me control, help me, because the Holy Spirit's always in control. Because I believe this is a word for people today. Because I'm about to go in a room a little bit, a room, a secret place. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Here we go, three things. Why it's going to speak on point number two. Here it is. His grace is greater than our mistakes. His grace is greater than our sin. His grace is greater than our guilt. His grace is greater than our shame. Come on. Come on. His, gra- His grace is greater than our rejection. Come on. You see, come on, come on. You got to understand that. Grace is greater. Come on. Grace is greater. Come on. Grace is greater than my sins and my shame. Come on. Grace is greater than my guilt. Let's say I wrote this down. His grace is it's more forgiving than your guilt. Well, that's Holy Ghost. Come on, read let me get His grace is more forgiving than your guilt. It is more beautiful than your brokenness. And it is more redemptive than your regrets. <laughs> that's Holy Ghost. Let me read that again. His grace is more forgiving than your guilt. I receive that. I receive that. Whew. More beautiful than your brokenness. <laughs> he takes beauty for ashes, you know. He takes, that's his word. He takes beauty for ashes. He takes ashes into beauty again. Come on. I bring him my ashes. He turns it into beautiful. I give my mess, my life, my wreck. He takes me a mess and turns me into his masterpiece. Woo! Come on. Come on. How many know I'm talking about? He takes a mess. A messed up, a messed up. He takes a mess like you and I, and he takes his mess, and because it's Christ in me, he takes his mess and makes it not your masterpiece, his masterpiece. Don't you know that you're his masterpiece? Listen, through the cross, through the cross, grace is more powerful to erase guilt. You just grab that. He erases guilt and shame. And, and, re- and remembers it no more. You have to forget. Because you have to forgive. Listen, grace, grace is so powerful at the cross that grace is big enough to cover your shame. Grace is real enough to heal your heart. 
I'm going to be talking about this now. Grace is strong enough to hold up you when you're weak. Here's the fourth one I'm talking about. Grace is sweet enough to cure any bitterness. Ooh, that's where you're going. Grace is sweet enough to cure any bitterness. Ooh. You see, grace is more, grace is compelling when explained, but it's irresistible when experienced. You just grab that. See, grace is powerful when you experienced it. See, I didn't realize this. Grace was 40 years ago for me. Walking into a concert. You always talk about that, Pastor. I'll never forget where I come from. You see, I didn't understand at all. But when Nikki Cruz spoke at that, at, at, at that outdoor uh, event, One Way Day, When I heard the word, the Holy Ghost was wooing me. You understand it? I didn't know I was about to walk into grace. And as I was walking forward through that crowd, there were hundreds of people there. But I just thought the man was just talking to me. You ever hear that in service where you hear somebody, you think they're just talking to you, and they got hundreds of people here. And you're like, that man must be reading my mail. No, it's the Holy Ghost. I don't go read mail. I, don't, I hardly read emails. And the Holy Spirit was wooing me because I didn't know 30 years later in Christ I would become a pastor. Where sometimes he don't tell you everything. <laughs> and I didn't realize that day at the cross I walked into grace. For Romans 3.20 says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. When he said all have sinned and fallen short of what God had, when, I, when he said that, all have sinned, I look back, here, I mean, this is why, this is what you've got to understand. When that Holy Spirit begins to woo you, you begin to come to your senses. Product, everybody was a prodigal at one time. Prodigal means wasted living. You were out there. Whether you were this far out there or way out there, you were out there. People say, how long? Hey, I got, a, I got a thing here. I don't have a whole lot of education, but lost is lost. I don't have a master degree in this, but I'm going to assume when somebody's lost, somebody's lost. It don't matter if you're a little lost or a lot lost. You're lost. Without Christ, you're lost. And I come to the place, our ability to appreciate grace is in direct correlation to the degree to which we acknowledge the need for it. I realized that day I needed grace. I needed forgiveness. You see, the more I recognized it, the more I recognized my sin and didn't hide in my sin. See, it's ugly. It's ugly truth. But hear about something about truth, which we'll do. Truth will make you free, or truth will make you miserable. Truth will set you free, or will make you miserable. Truth will cause you to run that way, or run that way. And there's two paths. And some people go this way, but a lot of people go that way. You see, there was a story that we read in John chapter 4. And I, I, this is bizarre because I've preached on this. I heard Pastor Chris preach on this about it's a woman at the well. It's a woman. Uh, it's Jesus goes to meet a woman at Jacob's well. And there's, and there's a Samaritan woman there. And we usually preach on the part that she brought the whole city back to Jesus. And it's like he went in souls and evangelism and all that, right? But there's a passage of scripture in that verse that I'm going to take these verses. And I didn't see this before. But Jesus pointed out something here. All right, here we go. She, uh, the story goes where the woman goes to the well. Jesus is at the well, Jacob's well. And Jesus, all, Jesus said, get me a drink. Could you get me a drink? And she said, I can't get you a drink. I'm a Samaritan. You're this. We shouldn't be associated with each other. And he said, if, and it, Jesus told us in verse 10. It's not on your screen yet. It says, if you knew the gift of God. He didn't say your gift. He said, if you knew the gift. 
if you knew the gift of God. And who is that who asked you for this drink? You would have asked, asked me, and I would, have, you, I would have given you a drink of living water because you thirst. Now, I read this so many times, and I'm going to come to verse 15 of that passage. Now, hear me out. This is a little, I might take you here. I might take you for a ride for a moment. And she said, it comes down to verse 15. She says, you know, she was telling a woman, you thirst. And something's, not question, and something's not quenching your thirst. You see, we can go out there and we think this is going to quench my thirst. And this is going to quench my thirst. But all it does is bring me further and further out into the world. Because why? We thought, we, we thought this would quench my thirst. We thought gambling would quench our thirst. We thought pornography would quench. We thought this one. We thought this one would quench my thirst. And come to find out it didn't do anything. And Jesus sees her, and she says, man, give, if you would add, if you don't know the, the gift. The gift is sitting right in front of you. The gift is Jesus. He's standing right here with the woman. She didn't realize the gift was right in front of her. Sometimes the cross is right in front of you, the gift. And we thirst, and the gift is always there. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And the woman said this. He, she said, sir, now I'm going to preach right here. This, this little passage right here. He said, please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I, will then I will never be thirsty again. I won't have to come here to get water. Look at this. And Jesus recognized something, and he didn't pretend that everything was okay. And sometimes we can't pretend that everything's okay when we're still hiding in sin. And Jesus said this. This is worth Jesus. Look at this. Catch this. Go get your husband, Jesus told her. Sometimes truth gets ugly. But either you can hide in it or you can let it expose and get rid of it. And many people like that, and and say, look, go get your husband, Jesus told her. In verse 17, she said, I don't have a husband. The woman replied, look at what Jesus says. Jesus said, you're right. Before we go on to this living world, let's get rid of sin. Before we, before we go on, you got to recognize, before you can collide with grace, you got to collide with sin first. And Jesus said, wait a minute, time out here. Let's, let's, not, let's, get, let's not forget where we're coming from here. Let's not jump to verse 35 where she brought the whole town to her. She brought the whole town. We like that verse where she's evangelism. No, no, wait a minute. Jesus said, wait a minute, there's something here we got to deal with. And he said, yeah, you're right. You don't have a husband. For you had five husbands. So apparently what you're doing is not working. So I'm going to let you know today, apparently what people are doing is not working. You go to one thing, now you got five things. This Holy Ghost, man. He said, you're right. For you have five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. That's Jesus. Jesus wasn't afraid to tell the truth because the truth will set you free or make you miserable. And the man you're living with right now, you ain't even married to the man you're living with. You certainly spoke the truth. Here's what I got out of this. Jesus doesn't step away from the truth. He describes the reality of what she's done and the mess that she's in. You've got to recognize sometimes the mess you're in. And what he's telling is this. The well of relationships. The well of pornography. The well, come on, of gambling. The well of addiction. The well of whatever. The well, what is the well? The well is where you draw from that's trying to quench your thirst and all it's doing is making you thirsty again because you haven't quenched the living water. You haven't had a taste of the living water. His name is Jesus. And he says the well of relationships that you keep seeking or drawing from isn't quenching your thirst. 
But if you would just draw from me the living water, I will quench your thirst. Come on. I am the living water. And he said this. He's, Jesus is not going to pretend that everything's okay when everything is not okay. If she's going to receive grace, she needs to stop hiding in her sin. That will preach. If she, well, if she wants to receive grace, she needs to stop hiding. Adam and Eve did it. They hid. In shame, they hid. This is hard truth right here. And I know we want to find another way. Anybody ask, oh, is there another way out of this? Is there another way? But here's the truth. Before we can collide with the grace of God, we must collide with the truth of our nature of our sin. Romans 6, 1, 1 2 says this. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? This is where we abuse grace. So we go on, should we go on sin? No, wait, but, but wait, what he says? Oh, yeah. What is it? Verse 2. By no means. We, we are those who have died to sin. How can we live in any longer? You see, he says this. Grace does not give you the freedom to do it. Grace gives you the resistance to walk away from it. See, because when I'm weak, he becomes strong. When I feel like I'm going to bow out, I couldn't help myself. Now, that's the whole problem. You help yourself. People tell me all the time, Pastor, I couldn't help myself. You're right. That's when you went into mess because when you help, you help yourself. Listen, you got to get in with the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Spirit will give you the grace to walk away. Because when I'm weak, he become, when I'm weak I am strong. Amen? Okay, here we go. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift, but the gift, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. He is the gift. Now I'm going to get into, I'm going to pray right now because I'm about to go into some rooms. I just gave you some onion, mom, and I gave you a salad. Now I'm going to throw a steak on you right now. You either chew a steak real slow. You enjoy it because why? You got to chew it. Because I'm about to go in some rooms. Are you ready? Lift your hands. Holy Ghost, I'm going to receive it. It's going to get ugly. But it's going to get true. You say, man, I should have went out of town this weekend. No, because you know why? God knew, God knew you had to be here today. And Father, I ask you, Lord, I would face ugliness. Because, Lord, the truth sets me free. The cross sets me free. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. This, uh, grace is greater than our hurts. Mm. If, you not ha- if you haven't been hurt in life, you, you are now dead. Listen. Everybody has wounds. Everybody has wounds. And everybody has hurts. So I'm good on this side. I'm good in the middle. I'm good on this end. Okay. Here's something that I understand. And this word out of Hebrews 12, 14, and 15. It says, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and be holy. But without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Then verse 15 comes in play. Well, we, okay, it's okay. You're going to be all right. Verse 15 comes into play. See to it that no one falls short. The translation says this. See to it that no one misses grace. No one misses grace. What is missing grace? Fail to obtain, fail to recognize, and fail to receive. I'm going to give you two stories in the Bible about this. See to no one. Here's a command. See to it that no one misses grace. Because if you miss grace, there could be something to follow it. And here it is. And that no bitter root will grow up. If you miss grace, I'm going to show you what this is about. It can cause a bitter root growing up inside to cause trouble and what? And defile many. 
You see, the command is followed by a warning. This is a warning. God will give us warning in his word. He said this will happen to someone if they miss grace. And a bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. I'm going to talk about a bitter root this morning. When we miss grace... The author of Hebrews says that a bitter root, and here it is. I'm going to go back into Hebrew culture. Hebrew culture says this, that at the time when he wrote this, in Hebrew culture, any poisonous plant would be called a bitter plant. The author of Hebrews, he's using this uh, bitter root as a, a metaphor about missing God's grace. Because when we miss God's grace, then things can become toxic that's bitterness that's hurts that's wounds everybody deals with this see a heart without grace becomes poisonous the bitter root may be small but it will slowly go in its growth and eventually become a poisonous plant that affects the whole body I mean, understand what I'm talking about here God's grace is sweeter than, and God's grace is so sweet, it's enough to cure bitterness. It's enough to cure bitterness. Let me tell you. You see, where do we store these hurts? We store them in the doors of our heart. Amen? We store them here in our closet. We call it our secret place. And everybody's got them. Come on, let's get real. Pastor, I don't float on water. No, I got, listen, you put them in that little special spot. I know. Because we all, listen, I know how we are. We put them in that little special spot. And we know it doesn't give us joy, but it constantly robs us of our peace. But yet, we can't put it down. You see, it's like having clutter in your closet. You take it and you put it into your secret place, and before you know it, the thing's a mess. Let me give you a, new, a, a little analogy, okay? This is, this is Holy Ghost. Listen. If you ever have three or four kids or five or seven kids, I don't know if you've got any, you know? You ever have a toy room that you just don't go into, that you, just, you want to close the door when people come over? Come on now. I'm not the only one that's this, this crazy. You go in and go, hey, somebody's coming over. Close the toy room. Come on now. What you say? Because why? That's a place of mess that we don't go in when somebody comes over. But listen, hear me out. Until you add, listen, the other day we had um, one of our rooms and my daughter was like, we call it like the room of mess. Like, I'm like, who can even live here? It's like just, oh my God. And she, one day, and my daughter came out there and said, Daddy, it's time, could you come over, you and mom will come over and help clean this room. What I'm saying is this, the Holy Ghost will never go into the room unless you're asked. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He will not go into the room of your heart until you ask. Because what happens is, we put a sign on off limits. And sometimes that's a secret place in our heart that we, you can have every room, but don't go in that room. Come on, Holy Ghost. It's called the secret place. Everybody's got them, come on. And we say, listen, because one day my daughter had somebody come over to clean the house. And she said, you can have every room. And she put a sign on, no trespassing off limit on the door of the bedroom. She said, don't even go in. In fact, daddy, if you mind, go over and lock it. And sometime, listen, that's how we do the Holy Ghost. And then Friday, I got the word. I've been wanting to clean that room for a long time. Get the shovels out, get everything out. I mean, look, get a, I want to throw a grenade in there. And just blow it to smithereens. You know what I'm talking about? You want to just throw a grenade in there and go, look, whoo boom. I don't know if whoever survived in there is okay. And I, you know what I'm talking How many know what I'm talking about here? And then, so what happens is this. She was asked to go in there, but listen, here it is. The first thing we had to do, we took the no trespass and sound. I was like, you know what? It's off limit now. You see, once you take the no trespass off your heart and say, Holy Ghost, come in, you come in. And I, went, oh, and I opened the door to that mess. 
I thought I had the hazmat unit on. I was going to walk in with those thing like, like spaceman thing, you know? And I'm just messing with you, you know? But you know what I'm talking about. And sometimes we have a heart like that that has clutter in it and pile up and we put a no trespass sign on it. And we tell the Holy Ghost, you can have every room in the house, but don't touch that room. Come on. That's my secret place. That's where, that's where I think that's where I hold hurt and wounds. So I went in there and listen, you look at it and I know toward the back is where the, the room, the side is where the desk is at and the sofa. And I know, Lord, what's in that sofa and what's behind that sofa. But you know, you couldn't get to it until you started walking out the little things first. See, sometimes you just ask the Holy Ghost, start walking. And the Holy Ghost will start working on the obvious things in your life. Come on. I went in the first thing. I looked in first. I went in and go, oh, Lord, today, Jesus. And I started to go in and I started to pick, you know, and I started to go through some things. That's how the Holy Spirit sometimes works. He gets you to operate. He takes the little things from you. Because why? He couldn't get to the little things because he, had to just, he has to get out he has to get the little things out of the way before he can handle his truth. And truth is that way. Truth is by that sofa, and the truth gets deep. But I had to get the clutter out. How I many you know what I'm talking about? I had to get the debris out. And that's the Holy Spirit because he's working in you. Because he can't reveal those things right now because why? It was so deep buried. But if you just allow me to take some stuff out in the front, I can slowly trust me enough to go into the back. Oh, that's the way it goes. If you allow me to trust me in the little things, and allow me to go in and say, Holy Spirit, take control. Take this mess. Take this thing out. He begins to de- go through. And as I got to the, I finally got to the back of the room. I said, okay, it looks clean, Bonnie. He said, yeah, I know it looks clean. But let's go after that couch. Could have bodies in that couch. I don't know what they got in that couch. I unpulled the couch, and there was so much debris behind the couch. And I said, that's what the Holy Ghost does. He takes stuff behind the couch. There's debris. But guess what? You allow him to move it out because why? You trust him enough. Come on, Holy Ghost. And I took the rug out. The little five by eight rug. I took it out. It looked good. I took it out. But you know what I did? I went outside and I shook it. I shook everything out of it. That's sometimes the Holy Ghost will take the rug out. You're hiding on the things. And he'll begin to shake it out. And after I shook it out, I went and took that big shot back. I said, you know what? When God wants to clean house, God wants to clean house. Because it's not going to make you better, it's going to make you better. And I took, the, I took all the couch. I wiped down the furniture. I looked around. I put the thing back. I'm like, Lord, and the Lord said, that's exactly like the room of your heart. It's a mess. But only I can take a mess and turn it into a masterpiece. Ephesians 4.31 says, get rid of all. Get rid. He didn't say harbor it. He didn't say get rid of all bitterness, all hurt. Get rid of it. Anger, rage, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Because why? Because how you believe is how you behave. Woo! How you believe is how you behave. So how we deal with hurts. How we deal with hurts. Come on, guys. How we deal with it. I get the mic back, so I don't. You got it. Okay, that was a five-year-old tornado that went through that toy room. (laughs) Oh, Lord. He's on peace. But we threw every toy they had since they are two away. Listen, you know, we we, we had pieces of broken toys from two years ago at Christmas. And they were still holding on to it. Sometimes we have pieces in our life of broken toys, broken things, relationships. And we, from years ago, and we still hold on to it. Even though I said, what is this, Bonnie? It's a piece of a toy. Apparently, it's important. And we put it over in the important box or something. I'm like, and that's how the Holy... See, sometimes we hold on to things that broken from years, and it doesn't make sense. We don't even understand how it even works anymore. But we hold on to it because it's broken pieces to our past. Yeah, Holy Ghost. So most of you know, um, heard me a couple of years ago talk about our Lifetime movie um, that happened with our daughter whose husband had an affair with that, whatever. Okay, so we've been through all of that. And, you know, sometimes you think that the Lord has healed you of a, oh, I'm done. I'm good with that. I'm done. Until he knows if you're done or not. 
Oh, the closet. He, the closet he knows. So something deep inside there might still be there that you think you got rid of. And so I did. So Friday, let me go back. Last Monday, I get a knock on the door. It's my neighbor next door. She comes over. She says, girl, I got to tell you something. And I'm like, oh, no man. No okay. She no. goes, I went to a shower yesterday. Sunday, we went to a shower. She said, and who you think is sitting at my table? No no oh, I'm not going to name a name, but it was a mother-in-law, ex-mother-in-law. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, that was nice. Gee, you had a good table. I'm thinking to myself. And she says, and she just started asking me all kind of questions about y'all. Like, how's your neighbors doing? And she was like, she didn't put it together at first. And she's like, oh. Basically, she said, basically, you, someone was about to, somebody was throwing you under the bus. How many know what I'm talking about? Yeah. How many, how many, how many, so, how many, how many have been thrown under the bus yeah. before? How many threw somebody? Well, you wasn't the thrown under the bus. I was thrown under I'm the bus. You were, I'm glad you wasn't, wasn't me. No, yeah, right. Yeah. I'm so so glad it's somebody else and not in, you. In, in as she's telling me this, she's like, because the lady's husband was, uh, my next door neighbor, her husband's very ill. And so every time he goes to the hospital, Derek goes over there and prays for him. I call and check on if there's anything I can do, whatever. Well, this particular time, she says, Oh, I'm sure Derek does stuff for you, but I bet you Bonnie doesn't do anything for you. Oh. No, look, well, that hurt my up, feelings. Yeah. yeah. I, and, but I didn't want to show that to my next door neighbor, so I was like, oh, that's all right. You know, it's all right. She's, you know, she's just speaking out of her anger. and It's all good. So I close the door and I go in and I tell Derek, I said, I am really hurt about this. Yeah. I Truth mean, hurts. I am really upset about this. She is talking to me and other people can, she's talking about me and other people can hear her. I mean, she is not being, she said some ugly thing. And Derek's like, Bonnie, don't go there. It's okay. Don't Do go, not go do there. Do not open the door. Do not open we the door. You've already to the been room. down this route. Okay. You already got. Schemes, schemes of the enemy. Yeah. You already got free from this. So just let it go. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, that's easy for you to say because she wasn't talking about you. She's talking about it's me. It's always easier for somebody to say, God's got this for you. And he's giving me all of that stuff. And it's like, I'm hearing it. I know it's right, but I'm not feeling it. Listen, you know, she so said like, something. Don't go back to what God has already freed you of. I told her, don't go back to what God has freed you of. But you know how you do that. But Sometimes you, you do do that. You go back and, and, and so... I had to go back to this huh? um, this I message that I taught on um, at a women's conference in Slidell. And I got this out because the Lord brought it to me. Three different things we can do with a hurt. Three ways we can deal with a hurt. And one of them is we can repress it, which is what we do. We get that hurt. And we put it, like he said, deep down in there. We push it down deep and we try to repress it and not think about it and not, re you know, go over it. We repress that thing. And, but, you know, like Derek said, a deep wound, it needs to be cut open. It needs to be cleaned out. You got to put in that, that, you know. Peroxide. Peroxide, that methylate. Remember that? You uh, kids probably don't. Uh, my life, yeah. methylate will go yeah, you away. You got to pour in that red stuff. <laughs> and you got to get that thing. Because if you don't, it won't close and it won't heal, right? So infection sets in if it goes untreated. And that's what happens when we repress it. We just bury it. We keep stepping on it. We keep saying, it's okay, I got it. Got it under control. I got it under control. But we never go in there and rip it open and clean it out. So we can repress. And in Hebrews, well, he already said it. I didn't, I didn't know put you were that, going there. Can you put that Hebrews 15 back up 12, there? 15. If not, it's not. I got it right here. Yeah. There you go. There okay, right. here we go. 
And it says here, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God, that a bitter root does not grow and it defiles. Because that's what it does. It defiles. Infection defiles your body. And that's what happens if you're a repressor. I was laying in bed this morning thinking about this, and the Lord goes, Ooh, you got all of those re-rees, because these are all re's. And <laughs> I'm like, you got to redo. You got to redo. Lord, this is probably, I've had to deal with all three of these, you know? So anyway, re we can repress it. And then this is what I also do. Rehearse it or rehash it. We can take that situation, and I can tell you. And y'all, I'm just being honest. This is, you know, it happened, I mean, the situations happen. Right. And not only do they happen to you, we have to deal with this too. My listen. heart has to deal with this fungus. Listen. We don't, so listen, here's the ugly truth. We don't have it all together. No, not yet. We're not striving. Yet. We're striving for it. We're striving. We're getting listen, there. We're, we're not, striving, listen. but it's not we're all not, together listen. yet. Be honest. We so deal. anyway, you know, it's like that favorite movie. Like I could watch probably... Steel Magnolias over and over and over and over. I like it. And um, that's what this rehearsal is. It's like a movie playing in your mind constantly. It's called it goes Groundhog over Day. Everybody watches Groundhog over Day. And over. And you keep, you keep watching it over and you keep rehearsing what they said. And I went back and said, oh, yeah, I thought about something else Linda told me she said about me. No name. No, that's the neighbor's name. I'm not naming the person that was talking about me. So anyway, how you heard, how you rehearsed it? Oh, I kept going over and over and over in my mind. What she said, she said about me. I said, I have never talked to this woman in three years. I have not. I've never talked to. I haven't. How can she say that about me? You see, she happened? don't even. She don't even know me. What happens? And when you, here's the thing. You know, we talk. When you rehearse it, you actually water the seed and resurrect and become alive again. Here it is. I'm going to talk about this for a minute. We don't, we're going, we're going to dip here a little bit. When you rehearse it and replay it over and over, and over I'm talking about a negative thing. Sometimes when I'm bummed out, I watch the same Super Bowl thing that day when, uh, what's his name, caught the interception back in 2000. And then that, that, that kind of pumps me up. But I'm talking about the negative stuff. You rehearse it, and what's happening is that this is the truth. It's ugly truth. You're actually watering the plant and causing it to get resurrected again. You bring life to it. And what happens is, as you're bringing life to it, you don't realize your, your actually is producing something inside of you. It's called a negative stronghold. Strongholds, positive, are good. When, when strongholds become a wall of protection for you. But when you allow the stronghold to, become in, to come in, now you become a prisoner of the thing that you have. And what happens is this. A stronghold is like reinforced rods of steel in cement when we poured the ground inside the building you see the little new cement when the wall came when it caved in out there right we just didn't pour cement somebody had to go in there put rebar and all that in what it did was it strengthened the material to make it strong well here is how strong operates when a stronghold gets in your life it's, uh, it's it's called this it produces negative thought patterns because what you believe is how you behave and it produces negative thought patterns that go over and over and over. And all you're doing is that you ain't reinforcing the rods of the cement to make it stronger. That's right. That's true. That's good. And what happens is a stronghold is made up to do things. It's, it's a powerful weapon of the enemy. It's a hard weapon to swallow. But when we rehearse it, we, have, we give it life, we breathe it. What happens is the stronghold takes dominion over you because Adam, and Eve, Adam was produced to take dominion over everything. And what a stronghold wants to do is it wants to take dominion over your mind. And your mind now controls, and now what your belief system is now not right. Because why? Your belief system comes contrary to the word of God. And that's what happens when you rehearse it over and over. I told you, get the tape out. I mean, I'm old fat. Get the DVD out. Throw it away. Do something with it. Because why? It wants to come back. And replay, it wants to take you back to a place that you, you thought was gone. Amen? Go. Right, and that's exactly what happened. You know, I thought I had all of this dealt with, and it was over and done with. But 
obviously there was still a little small piece. And she's preaching on this. She didn't even know it. That was in, still left in my heart. And sometimes, you know, that happens a lot of times. So we can, we can repress that. We could shove that down. Instead of surrendering to God, we can repress it. We can rehearse it. We can go over and over and over again and replay it and rehash it. And that's, that's how some people deal with it. Or what we need to do is to release it. Ooh. Okay. Oh, we need hard. to release it. Grace. We, Right, and that's, that, that's only going to be God's grace that is even going to help you to release that. You know, when Stephen, when Stephen was being stoned in Acts, um, hmm, Acts 7, I think it was, huh? Acts 7, Stephen was being stoned. And I mean, this man, his physical body was being stoned, and he's like, Lord, don't hold their sin against them. That's what he said. Ain't not he there said, yet. I mean, they <laughs> are. Not there yet. <laughs> don't hold their sin against him. And can I tell y'all? That's not what my first thought was. No. It was not. It wasn't that, it wasn't that nice. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm like, I'm so disappointed in myself. I'm so disappointed in myself because I wanted to be above that. I wanted to be like Stephen and say, Lord, even Jesus, while he was on the cross, what did he say? Lord, forgive them because they don't know what they are doing. They don't know what they're saying. And that is exactly they're this lost. case. They're, they're, lost. Lost. they're lost. They don't know what they're doing and they don't know what they're saying. So. We have to, and guess what, guys? You know, it might not happen, boom, like yeah. that. But every single day, you have, to, you have to release. I mean, that's what you need to do. You don't need to repress it, but we do. We don't need to rehearse it and no, rehash do. it, but oh. we do. We need to release it, but we don't. Grace. You know what I'm saying? We need to do that. We need to release, and, um, and we don't. We have to. We have to release that. you got to make it in your mind. If it's every single day you wake up in the morning and you say, I choose to forgive and to release. Ooh. Whether you feel like it or whether you don't, you make that choice. Even if you don't feel like it, I guarantee you. And then you pray. You pray for them. You pray for them. And we could have also put repent in here because I needed to repent. Yeah. So that's yeah, the repentance bring humbleness, man. It causes yeah, you it, it causes it cause you to go, man, you know, um, you know, I would like it this way here. Look, why don't you say this? Up, right? let's, let's I think it. that, you know, what you need to do is to attach a name yes. and a mm. face to your hurt, to what it is that you need, God, and then you need to take that. I don't I don't know what whatever it works for you. You know, right. I, I remember I had to punch and cry in a pillow a lot. I mean, because let me tell you, you can hide it and repress it, but Jesus already knows. He knows it. He knows what's in here. He knows what you're thinking. I don't care how good you look on the outside, which I did a good job on the outside. Until she got inside the house. <laughs> I'm going to kill her. <laughs> Right. See, and that's how we do sometimes. We do good on the outside. I'm okay. Everything's okay. Everything's all right. But we then we go back into the room, the closet, the secret place. And what we do? We take it. We put it in there. Before you know it, the thing's so, <laughs> the door's so, so much sunny. out. We repressed it. We hold on to it, you know? Uh, well, I, I thought, I said, Lord, I am not coming out of this room till I can release this. Yeah. I am not coming out. I'm not coming out. I don't care. I'm not coming out. That, well, she said she went it in took place. me a yeah. very long time to come out the room. She didn't cook? I don't cook. That's nothing new. I don't do that. She said, I'm not coming out. But I didn't drive I, through. That's, that's for right. sure. Yeah. I yeah. was she not coming that. out. She said, I'm not coming out this room. To, I'm not coming out this room, so we're not eating. I said, well, you don't cook anyway, so it's no big deal. She said, go on in. Leave me alone. Let me deal. Now, Stan, let me deal. So.
So anyway, this morning I'm getting dressed and I'm thinking to myself and I, that thing started to come back and I was like, oh no, devil, that is under the blood. We ain't going there. I'm not done. Going I'm not today, under devil. The blood not and today. I'm not going not today, devil. Not today. Not today, Satan. Not today, Satan. Yeah, come on. Come so on. Anyway, just, would, you know, you to, like, so anyway, I just would, you know, you need to look at what step you're in. If you're re, if you're repressing, if you're rehearsing, or if you are releasing and repenting and um that's my story that's i'm sticking story. to it that's your story sticking to it all right amen come on amen here we go here we go you see remember remember she said uh she might repeat it that make sure that you don't miss you miss grace i'm gonna show you a story about people miss grace see what happens is is that you come to a place The, uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 18, we do this story maybe at our weekends that we do uh, free, uh, weekends. We have, uh, um, it says, uh, the, it was a story of the unmerciful servant. The un Listen, this is, this, is, this is good. It says, make sure that you don't miss grace. Okay, make sure you don't miss grace. Okay, you got to, I know you something. I know you weren't finished yet. I can see it. Come on. Go ahead. Um, to say what helped me to come out the room All and right. then I'm gonna All right. what helped me finally to be able to come out after I could is because the grace of God but I was in my room and it was kind of like the Lord came to me now I know he doesn't talk he talked to me this way who do you think you are mm. that made me cry because he said who do you think you are? This morning when you got up, this is what he was bringing to me. You asked me, I mean, last night before you went to bed, you asked me to forgive you for any sin you made that day, known or unknown. And when you closed your eyes to sleep, I forgave you. So who are you and who do you think you are that you would hold this against somebody else? Oh. And I was word. like, was ugly. you're right, Lord. Who am I that I would hold that against somebody else, against this person? Who am I? You, you've forgiven me of big things and little things, and here I am holding this garbage that I thought I released. Amen. That's how I came out. So God will, you know, All right. what you're I doing, want. Good. You're doing good. You might as well stay up here anyway because I think you're going to be going in now. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, I'm good. You're good? You're good, good? You're finally good, good? Okay, good. All right, good. All right. Listen, we don't, we, listen, we go on, we're not rehearsing. We just feel the Holy Ghost will start taking in because we don't want to rehearse. You say this, I say that. I, listen, I don't want to never, I never want to manipulate the Holy Ghost because I believe the Holy Ghost is moving right now. Can you say the Holy Ghost is moving right now? It's, it's running deep. Okay, here it is, story of unmerciful servant. Uh, Matthew 18 said, therefore, the kingdom of God, a kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with his servant who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions, say millions, millions of dollars. He couldn't pay. He couldn't pay. So his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife and children, everything he owned to pay the debt. But the man fell down, fell before his master and begged him. Here it is, his grace, his grace. Please be patient with me and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him. That is grace right there. That is grace, okay? Make sure that you do not miss grace. But the, and he released him and forgave him of his debt. In other words, he wrote it off. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed them only a few thousand dollars. He just missed grace. He missed it. And a root of bitterness came into him. 
He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more. Have you heard this? He should have heard this. Same thing he said just a few moments earlier. Be patient with me. I will repay it, he pleaded. Okay, just heard it. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw him, they were very upset. And they went to the king and told him everything that had happened. And the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the, then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tormented or tortured until the, he had paid the debt and fi- entire debt. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to give your brothers and sisters from the heart. Now here's a word. He had just had grace fall on him. But he failed to obtain it. And he allowed a bitter root to come in. And the thing about his today is this. Grace works both ways. You receive it from God, but refusing to give it to somebody else is not an option. Come on. God's grace works two-way street. It's receiving it from God, but refusing it to give is not an option. If God forgives us, then we can't keep account of people who don't. Here's a word. Stop thinking about what has been done to you and start thinking about what has been done for you. It's Holy Ghost, man. It's Holy Ghost. Stop thinking about what has been done to you and start thinking what has been done for you. That changes the whole story. You see, we got to come to a place. Why? Because here it is. We're never more like Jesus than we, are, than we are when we forgive. Mm. If, you don't, if you don't, if you refuse to forgive, that's great, it's the grace, it's the, it's the grace. If you refuse and keep the person who has hurt you in a prison, you pay the price and they don't. Let me get, hear me again. If you refuse to forgive somebody who hurt or wronged you, and keep that person who has hurt or wronged you in your little prison, you pay the price and they don't. Because why? You can't sleep at night. You can't do this at night. You constantly have anxiety, worry. What happened? You're being turned over. Listen, when you get turned over to somebody, they become master. And people don't realize it was a little thing. Yeah, it was a little thing that became a big thing. Here it is. Here's the truth. What my wife was doing and what people do is that we're going to, we, here it is, I spoke this about a year ago. I'm going to go back into it for a few moments. It's worth it. What happens is she was trying to collect from the uncollectible. We try to collect from people who don't even give a care. That's truth. You see, the truth is this. I wrote this down. The truth of the matter is that there are some things that happen in life that you must forgive without the benefit of an apology. This Holy Ghost, man, this is Holy Ghost. I'm going to take our time with this for a little bit. My wife, my wife, what we do, what she was doing, she was, listen, you have to forgive without the benefit of an apology. It was for your survival, not theirs. You see, it's, it's your, listen. Sometimes in life, it's only by God's grace because you can't do this in you. If I could release them, it'd be no problem. But I rehearse it over and over and over. Apparently I can't. We gotta come to we gotta come to the realization of being honest with ourselves is number one. You see, if we keep hiding stuff 
and say everything's fine, everything go away. If the church is fine and okay, why are we in the condition that we're in? Why is everybody, you know, you got prayer for, I mean, every, it's why. Because why we have wounds and hurts here. And, we, and listen, the Holy Spirit will give you the grace. Listen, the Holy Ghost will give you the grace and the power to forgive others, but the Holy Ghost will give grace to you to forgive yourself. See? Sometimes we have a problem, we have a problem forgiving others. Sometimes the worst thing to do is have, we have we have the grace to forgive ourselves. At least that's why his grace is sufficient, because when I can't do it, he become, look, I am weak, he becomes strong. He gives me the power to release. See, I can't, I can't do it on my own, but with him giving me the strength, I can let go. I, it's called writing off. I told her, sometimes you have to have a pen and you have to write off the debt is clear. Sometimes you have to go home. Listen, it's a homework assignment. This is you and a God. It's Holy Ghost. Sometimes you might have to go get pen and paper and start writing down some people and say, you know what? The debt is canceled. You know when people can't collect from you when you're out of a job and you keep on sending you nasty grams? After a while, the credit to people go after a while. You know what? This is not really worth our being. We're wasting time, stamps, money, everything else in the world. Why don't you give them a letter saying the debt's canceled? Because why? We're trying to collect from the uncollectible. And at times, we do that ourselves. Listen, here's a word here. We want an apology from somebody. And listen, I'm going to be straight up with you. They ain't losing one bit of sleep over you, boo. Maybe they're up at night. Maybe they're doing this. And no, they're sleeping at night. You're the one that's got problems walking around and pacing the floor. Okay? Because why now you really realize that you put them in prison, but now you're in prison. You're in a holding tank. And I wrote this down. You must, here it is. Sometimes you got to just say, Lord, I got to let it go. Oh, man, it's just, without, without the grace of God, you can't do that. I'm telling if you had it in you, then you don't need Jesus. You know what I'm talking about here? All right, here we go. Here we go. Okay. I must learn that in spite of, of your right to be vindicated or reimbursed. Come on now. Everybody's been there. In spite of your right to be vindicated or reimbursed, some people will not or cannot give you what you ought to do. Woo! We want to be vindicated. We want to be somebody apologize to me. Tell me they wrong. All I'm waiting for the word, I'm sorry. You know what, honey? It may not happen. And sometimes in life, you don't get the benefit of it, even though it's just, it's just your due. Sometimes you have to write it off. Because why? The master has written off your debt, which was millions. Here it is. Here it comes into play. The master has wrote off your debt, which was millions. Why let... Thousands overrule millions. Whew. Here it is. The only way you can collect your energy and move forward is to simply say, I write you off. I release you. You are free. Why? So that, why? So that you can focus on what, and he said that earlier today, so that you can focus on what's ahead of you Rather than what is behind you. Woo! You can focus your energy on what is ahead of you. Here it is now. Here it is. Here it is. You can't drive forward with your eyes fixated on a rearview mirror. It's Holy Ghost. You cannot. Listen. A rearview mirror is only looking what the glance of what was behind you. But never fixate yourself on what was behind you. A rearview mirror is simply that. It's to look and glance where you were and keep going to where you're going. And some people drive constantly in the rearview mirror and you wonder why you get off course. And you wonder why you lose your focus. Because why? You're looking in the rearview mirror. He says this. You look back, don't get mesmerized on this. And the last thing I'm going to close out with is simply this. Grace is greater than our circumstance. Paul said this in Corinthians 1.8. I'm closing. Give me a close down. I'm coming to close on this thing. We don't want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experience and the problems. They Paul was under tremendous stress. Circumstances will give us under tremendous stress. Everybody knows that. I'm going to preach on that. We know that, okay? We were under great pressure. We were under what? Great pressure far beyond what? 
the ability to endure, far beyond what we can handle. In other words, the weight of the bar was so heavy, I couldn't lift it. And I shook. I tried to get this thing up, and it was heavy. So that we were in despair, so that we despised our life itself. In other words, we were so, we were thought we were going to be dead. Indeed, indeed, no, not. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. You see, sometimes, stay right here for a second. Paul explains, sometimes we're under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure. And Paul realized that the weight of the bar is more than I can handle. Sometimes in life, the weight of the bar is more than what you can handle. And Paul had a realization. He humbled himself enough to be honest with himself and admits his abilities was not equal to the circumstance. He came to the ability to say, listen, I can't do this in me. The question is, so why would God allow this mismatch to happen? Verse 9 is why. Indeed, we felt like the sentence of death was around us, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves but on God. Verse 9 now comes into play. Who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. He delivered you before, he'll deliver you again. On him, we set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. Hebrews 4, 16 says this. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence. That's where I have to go to at times. That's what Bonnie had. We had to go into a place. We had to go into a secret place. It's called the throne of grace. How many know you've been there before? It's called the throne of grace. That what? And what? So that we, what? Receive mercy and what? Find grace. To help us in our time of need. Paul said, I thought the circumstance was well beyond my ability. The mess I was in was greater than how I could even think. You ever been in before? Come on. Circumstances were here, and I felt like I was here. And I felt like you were putting 250 pounds on a ball, and you told me to go lift it off the bench. And I was shaking and trembling to try to get it up. And then I realized, in me, it could not be done. But in him, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And, the, and you ask yourself, why is this happening? Why is this a mismatch? And you say, why? So my grace will be sufficient for you. Because when you are weak, then you now become strong. My grace is sufficient for you. I don't know about you, but every morning I wake up and I say, Lord, I need grace for this morning. If you want to hang out with two friends, I'm going to give you two good friends to hang out around with. It's called grace and mercy. David said, grace and mercy shall be upon us you dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Every morning, I humble myself because you know what? I don't know what I'm going to get into. I don't know who I'm going to get into. I don't know what I'm going to get into. And every morning, I humble myself. I say, Lord, in me today, I cannot do it. I can't do it, baby. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't. I tried a thousand times. It don't work. So let me just try it one more time. Listen, if the thousand time it didn't work, one more time, it's going to be the same progress. Same thing. I have to come to a place, like Bonnie said. You got to come to that place. You have to come to release Lord I, need, Lord, I need grace for today. Because your grace is sufficient for me. It's more than enough. Because, yea, I become more than a conqueror through him who gives me strength. Yes. Bow your head. Father, I thank you for the word today. I think we, don't, I think we don't did all we can say. Father, I want to thank you for the word. I want to thank you for the blood. I want to thank you, Lord, for your presence. Ephesians 2.8 says, it was by grace you were saved through faith. It was grace. When you walked up here, 
and a sinner came home to God. And he came home. It was what? It was by grace through faith. It took faith to get out of a seat. It took faith to make me walk out, walk from a a, a big concert on the grounds of a field uh, and walk walk to the front of that thing. It took took faith. But you know what? It was by grace. He said, it was grace that you saved. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift, but the gift, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So today, where it says you were saved by grace through faith. Father, in the name of Jesus in this building, I just want to make sure everybody here is saved by grace through faith. You say, Pastor, I'm, I need the cross. I need Jesus this morning. Pastor, I'm talking to me today. I need you. I need Jesus. I can't do it in me. I give up. I surrender. The prodigal son came to his senses and said, I'm going to go back to my I'm going to go back. You've got to come to the place of the cross and say, Lord, I give up. I repent. Jesus, I need you in my heart. It's called being born again, being saved by grace. If that's you this morning, raise your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. Anywhere around this building, I want to make sure we're all here. Saved by grace. Let's just stand on your feet.